Hello and welcome to Viewpoints. I'm Eric Dahl of the Center for Homeland Defense and Security at the Naval Post Graduate School. My guest today is Farah Pandit. She is a world-leading thinker and scholar and expert on countering violent extremism. She served in a number of senior positions in U.S. administrations, and she also is the author of a new book entitled How We Win, which describes her thinking on how we can counter violent extremism today. Farah, welcome to CHS and NPS. Thank you. Happy to be here. It's great to have you here. Thank you. We'll talk about your book in just a minute, but first I thought maybe if you could tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to work in this space, in this problem area, that fascinating background. Well, thank you. And, you know, no one ever wants to think that they can plan to be working on issues of violent extremism. In fact, uh, we wish that there was no such job. Uh, but I, I had, it came to this right after 9-11, actually. Mm. Uh, but I, it was really uh, uh, the beginning of my interest in what we would call not, in low intensity conflict or international security issues mm. around the world came when I was in graduate school. Mm. And I was focusing at the Fletcher School on international security studies. And the summer between my first and second year, I went to Kashmir, uh, uh -huh. in, and that is an, a region of the world, actually, it's where I was born. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I was interested in understanding what was happening between India and Pakistan and what the Kashmiris, what was actually taking place on the ground in Kashmir. Mm -hmm. And I got a grant from the Security Studies Program to go in in the summer of 94 and interview militants and talk to government officials. Mm -hmm. And so it was my first opportunity to really learn about ideology and how people get motivated to join organizations or to move forward for a purpose. Fast forward to 9-11. And when 9-11 happened, uh, I was working in the Boston area in the private sector. And I had a, like many Americans, a visceral reaction when 9-11 happened. We wanted to protect uh, the homeland. We wanted to understand what we could do to be, um, to be on the responsive side and not on the defensive side. And I was very fortunate that I was able to go back into government uh, in the George W. Bush administration. Uh, right after 9-11, I felt as though the this terrorist organization was trying to define my country, America. It was trying to define my religion. I'm a Muslim. And it made me really angry. And I thought, there's more I can do. And I didn't really care what it is I did. I didn't care how I served. I cared that I was able to be part of an, uh, the effort to be able to push back against that ideology. Well, and now, several years later, uh, you've been able to, to put all that experience and those thoughts together into this fascinating book with your arguments about what we should be doing today. And uh, let me just start out asking you, one of the main arguments you make is that after 9-11, we focused mostly on the hard power of, of dealing with violent extremism, the sort of kinetic power, as we, as we call it often here at the Naval Postgraduate right. School. Uh, but you argue that we, we didn't do enough, or at least not well enough, in the soft power area. Can you tell us about that? Well, let's be really frank, okay? Government can talk about military action in a very fluid way. We know how to measure it. We know when we're successful. We know when we're not successful. We know how to stand up our our, our opportunity to go out there and get the enemy. Uh, we know how to organize ourselves. We know how to build a strategy. And importantly, we have the financial resources to be able to back up everything that we are doing. When 9-11 happened, obviously, we had to make sure that the homeland wasn't hit again. We had to stand up brand new efforts uh, around intelligence, around following financial the flow of money for terrorist organizations. We had to understand how we could think about homeland security security in a new way. So new departments were set up, new instruments of coalitions uh, were set up, and partnerships around terrorist finance. We thought very strategically about what it is we were trying to do. And later came to the game where we were thinking around, uh, well, how do we make sure that young people aren't actually joining the armies of Al-Qaeda? That component, that soft power dimension, is hard for people to understand. We can't really quantify it, can we? If I have a program out there, I can't tell you because you were part of that program, I can 100% convince you that, or convince myself rather, mm -hmm. that we will never see you become radicalized. We don't have the kind of money behind these kinds of things. So when I when I look at how our, our posture was post 9-11, I think it was the right posture to go after, obviously, the mm -hmm. kinetic component. But we 
swiftly should have in the years since, it's been 18 years since 9-11, developed a hard and soft power strategy that is not separated from each other, but is connected uh, at scale and with everything that we have to make sure that young people aren't moved in the direction of extremism. And yet the State Department has been trying for at least 10 years to try to do just that. They've had different offices. You mentioned new offices, new office for, offices for county and radicalization, soft power. Now you've been at the highest reaches of the State Department. What, what's been wrong? Why haven't those programs worked or not worked well, well enough? We, what we have seen is promise in some of the pilot programs that were started in the Bush administration, amplified in the Obama administration, that we know have the opportunity to do far more. We have not done soft power at scale. It has been ad hoc. The way we look at the dimensions of this have been regional rather than from a demographic across the world. And I know we'll get into more hmm. about what actually is going on, but the setup was wrong. Hmm. And, and one other component, which is really important, the money to match our interest was nowhere to be found. So pennies on the dollar to do soft power is not gonna get you the results that you want. Uh, and, no, and you talked about places in the Department of State that were stood up mm -hmm. to be able to work on this dimension of the fight. Uh, it was spread all over the interagency. It was a little bit of DOD, a little bit of mm -hmm. USAID, a little bit of here, a little bit there. Uh, and that's not a way to win an ideological war. You need mm -hmm. somebody waking up every single day whose commitment and whose focus is to understand every element of the soft power fight, every element of the war of ideas, and design the strategy that is mm -hmm. 24 seven with everything that we have. So my argument is this, while we say we have worked on soft power, we've hardly begun. And the United States and no other country in the world, by the way, has gone all in. Hmm. And hmm. I believe if America were to go all in to really show what we know about ideology, about a 24 seven system mm -hmm. where young people were being pushed uh, 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 forward mm -hmm. so that they have the resilience that they need, we'd see a very different result. Okay, well, let's talk about that a bit. All in sounds sounds good. Uh, coming up with more money, more effort for soft power sounds good. But of course, that's not, not easy in any administration, in any environment. And of course, soft power itself has been talked about for many years. But you have a little bit of a different take on what soft power is. Isn't that correct? You describe open power. Can you tell us how that's different from what we usually think in terms of sort of cultural power, the soft power of Hollywood movies and things like that? We have looked at soft power the way we looked at soft power in a Cold War context. Hmm. So we've been stuck in a rut in terms of what tools we have in our toolbox. In the 21st century, we need to be more creative. We need to understand what's possible for us. So it's not just about Madison Avenue or Hollywood, or Hollywood hmm. doing something, or in fact, uh, uh, the kinds of partnerships we would have expected in the Cold War uh, hmm. framework. We are looking at a, a way and opportunity to think through like design thinking. Hmm. How can we evolve hmm. so that there are many, many different kinds of programs with many experts that can actually help and aid us? My book argues the solution for winning the war of ideas isn't only dependent on government. We've just mm. talked about government, what mm -hmm. government can do. It also talks about what the private sector and what regular citizens can do. And mm. without every element of that, mm. we will never be able to win. But my argument on this, on this open power component mm -hmm. is it's how government thinks about power. What I say is we've, we have looked at power as power over. We win when we have, we have uh, surged with our power, rather than thinking about power in terms of a shared power. If we have a goal to make sure that young kids aren't joining a group like the so-called Islamic State or the, the Al-Qaeda or Boko Haram or any other kind of group, or in fact, a white supremacist mm -hmm. group huh. or a neo-Nazi group or the identitarians. Huh. What can government do? It can open up the aperture. It can look for solutions that don't necessarily exist within the bureaucracy of government and to put those kinds of people around the table in real time, huh. turning things 
on its head. Not saying that we will win if we tell you what to do, but we open up the solutions and we allow it to be fluid enough that we're able to respond in a different way. We do this in other dimensions. Why we are not doing it around uh, around things that government can look at. There are certain categories of threat. A climate change uh, is a good example. A virus like Ebola uh, is another example, and so is an ideology of extremism. Mm -hmm. These types of problems can be solved and should be solved with a different system than just the old-fashioned way of us looking at how to look at the dimension of soft power. So, open power is a derivative of soft power, mm -hmm. and it is ready and ripe for the 21st century. Well, that's fascinating. And thinking of ideology as a, as a virus uh, it really sort of gets the mind going. You know, many of our students in the Center for Homeland Defense and Security here are uh, state and local officials in law enforcement or emergency management, fire. Uh, and one of the, the greatest problems, the challenges that they have in this area is very local. It's super local. Just like you were saying, it's about young people. One of, the, one of our students once said, if you could figure out how many kids from our high schools in Minneapolis or, or in any other community in this country are going to be radicalized the next year and are going to try to get on a plane and fly to Turkey or someplace and, and go and fight for ISIS, uh, then, then we could do something. But otherwise, what, what can we do? So what, what can we do at, at a very local level? Uh, have you been involved at that level with you know, local communities, high schools, maybe even junior high? I don't know. Well, let's be really clear. You can't fix a problem when it's the crisis moment, can you? Your students and others who are in graduate school here understand that the preparedness function requires us to be building preparation before the crisis happens. And we cannot respond in a real way only when someone's been radicalized and is about to get on a plane to go somewhere or, in fact, put a bomb in their backpack and go to Boylston Street in Boston, yeah, yes. okay? So what we have to be doing as a society is to understand that the ideology of us versus them in whatever amplification it comes out, whether it is a neo-Nazi group hmm. or it is the so-called Islamic State, is a dimension of the fight that we have not taken seriously as government. We've thought it's too squishy. It's something that we can't do. We know what to do when that bomb is about to go off or that person is about to go do something. What do we, what do, we do mm -hmm. in, the, in the time where people are formulating who they are? This issue of identity is the central issue to the tra challenge we are facing. Ideology comes out of people who, who are asking questions about who they are and who they belong to. So when you think about what our response ought to be, there has to be dozens and dozens and dozens of touch points along that young person's life, as young mm. as we can do it, mm. to push back against hate, to talk about what it means to be uh, in an in, in environment so that they feel like that they belong, and so that the narratives of extremists that tell them, you don't belong, so come over mm. to me, will not be appealing to them. I'll say one one last thing. The human brain does not develop until the age of 24. Hmm. We as government need to be thinking about that process of maturation and how we get how we disrupt the thinking along the way. And if you look at it from a social science perspective, which is something that government doesn't do, <laughs> but has to, because to your students' point, if they are saying, how do we do this? What I know, having worked on this issue since 9-11, having built dozens and dozens of programs around the world at the local level, mm. I know that there, the, the strength of the US government is to be the convener and the facilitator and the intellectual partner with the ideas that we hear on the ground. So the mm. grassroots, the local, the community efforts to push back against hate and extremism really matter. What government can do is to be the convener and the facilitator and the intellectual partner with the ideas that we hear on the ground. So the relationship between government and local partners, NGOs, community leaders, and others has to be really strong.
We have to be able to believe that the nuanced solutions that communities know will work with their young people and others are the things that we need to invest in. But I also will say that businesses, the corporate sector, has a role to play, as do regular citizens, because the local infrastructure that happens for young people as they're growing up are, are touched by what happens with the community, with the, with the corporates, the businesses that are in the community, and in fact, what, how, they, how others talk about uh, each other and in, in, in the cohesion that is built within these communities. We, we look also uh, not just in the offline space, hmm. but we also look in the online space. And that's another place where we can think about what can we do when your student asks, hmm. well, what can we do? We know that we've been lazy on hate. We know that there's been a surge of hate uh, ideology online. And we know that the algorithms that are used by technology companies move you in a direction to, to be so that, so that they're amplified, that the mm. hate speech is amplified, that soon you are only surrounded by others who think like you, behave like you, and like the things that you like. So we're in a really dangerous moment in time, but we're not in a moment in time where all hope is lost. We know know all these things after 9-11. So when I look at the threat that we're facing and why, you know, why we need to be resilient at this moment, it's because if we don't, uh, the numbers are growing of young people globally. They are all digital natives. They are connected. So whether you are in Detroit or you're in Dhaka, um, you are, your ideas are connected on online networks. And importantly, and this is really critical for Americans to understand, there is no difference in my view, between the domestic threat and the international threat. Hmm. Ideology has no borders. So groups are learning from each other. And even groups that hate each other are looking at the winning playbooks from each other. Hmm. So building that kind of resilience against us versus them requires government to think differently, to partner at the local level, and most importantly, to not be lazy on hate. <laughs> that lazy on hate, that, that's a, a great line and, and it makes a lot of sense. And, and I especially liked your comments about the domestic uh, space and domestic threats and in particular as you know just in the last couple of weeks DHS and, mm -hmm. and other uh, leading Homeland Security uh, authorities have spoken out and be begun turning their focus a little more toward domestic right-wing racist other hate groups yes. as opposed to a more strict focus that we've had since 9-11 on the Islamist threat and would you say that your your ideas this idea about uh, we need to focus on, on hate. Do those apply as much to other kinds of hate, domestic, right-wing, uh, racist hate, as much as to the Islamist threat? We have to understand that nothing is separated. You know, it's like you're in a restaurant and somebody is smoking mm -hmm. and you're in the section that is non-smoking and you <laughs> think that the smoking section that's right next to you isn't <laughs> going to affect your meal. Mm -hmm. Of course it does. Everything that's in the ether, everything that you are living and experiencing in a community matters. Our government cannot look the other way with the rise of anti-Semitism. It cannot look the other way with the kinds of hate crimes that are going on in our country. It cannot look the other way with neo-Nazis and white supremacists and also importantly, the connections between those groups and, uh, and their like-minded groups in other parts of the world, particularly in Europe. So we have to be resilient. Like after 9-11, when we looked around and thought, where do we have to go? How do we have to think differently about what our threat is? Uh, we Countering violent extremism is the uh, application of, and of pushing back against us versus them. And I have to be really clear because a lot of people don't actually know that when we started, when CVE began in the Bush administration, mm -hmm. the war of ideas was not just uh, apl applicable to groups that use Islam as their rallying cry, but also to other kinds of extremists. We didn't see the kind of threat at that time. Today, unfortunately, in 2019, we're looking at a surge Hmm. of white supremacists, anti-government uh, you know, anti also, mm -hmm. and in fact, um, other kinds of extremist groups alongside now, uh, Al-Qaeda, the so-called Islamic mm -hmm. State, and, and others. So, so when you talk about the Department of Homeland Security and their strategy to go forward, they are correct 
to include mm -hmm. this new, the new formulation of, mm -hmm. of, of the threat to the homeland. What I hope that the, the Department of Homeland Security will do with the backing of Congress is to apply what we've learned over 18 years since 9-11, which is you have to be able to help uh, local groups work on local solutions. And that mm -hmm. requires government to, to give grants, to form partnerships, and to do a lot more than we have unfortunately been doing in the last mm -hmm. few years. Well, and in fact, you have a lot of experience with DHS. One of the many positions that you've held uh, was on the Homeland Security Advisory Council, advising the secretary of DHS a, a few years ago. I, and of course, as you know, uh, DHS continues to, uh, uh, to be faced with many challenges yes. as we are nationally in the Homeland Security area. Uh, how do you think we're, we're doing uh, in, in Homeland Security? And, and if you don't mind talking about uh, DHS, I mean, how, how do you think DHS could, could try to uh, readjust what it's doing? We know they're shifting their focus a, a little bit, but, but what else can they, can they do? Well, one of, the, one of the things that I did when I left government in 2014, I, had been, I was very lucky um, and honored to be able to serve uh, on the advisory council for Secretary Jay Johnson. And I chaired the task force on countering violent extremism where we wrote a report uh, for our country mm. in 2016 that said, this is what you need to do. Here is the 50 state plan. Mm. So right now, the solutions are at our fingertips. And what I want DHS to do is not to create a new wheel, but to in fact look at what, it was a bipartisan hmm. report, mm -hmm. uh, going very specifically into the different kinds of extremist threats that are out there, but more importantly, the opportunities to be successful in defeating that ideology, hmm. which meant that it was not just the Department of Homeland Security mm -hmm. that, was a, that had to touch this issue, mm -hmm. but the Department of State, the Department of Education, the Department of Health and Human Services, mm -hmm. Uh, on and on, that it is a multi-dimensional mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, collaboration across the interagency that has to work on these. And importantly, and this is, I talked about mental health earlier, we don't have any place in the United States today that is really a youth protection center for the kind of radicalization that we need. So I want the Department of Homeland Security, I want our country to think bigger. This threat isn't going to shrink. It is going to get bigger because of the numbers of people who are finding this ideology of us versus them appealing. Hmm. And so we need to be creative about what's coming in the kinetic component of war. Mm -hmm. We have people all day, every day, whose job it is to design for the wars that are coming, to make sure that we have the weapons that are ready for the wars that are coming, to look at every dimension mm -hmm. of what that might mean, mm -hmm. even if it might seem far-fetched. There is nobody in our government whose job it is to think about the preparedness posture for what is coming ideologically. And it is unbelievable to me that that, that can be. So I, what I want our country to do, not just the Department of Homeland Security, is to get real. Hmm. Hmm. I want us to think about what is coming. I can give you one very specific example. You look at the dimension of young women who have been radicalized to join the so-called Islamic State. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, everybody in America was surprised, surprised that women could get radicalized, that they would leave their homes and mm -hmm. get on planes and go to Syria mm -hmm. to fight for the so-called Islamic State. Now let's remember where those mothers and children are right now in camps that are the next you know, the next you know, dimension of a complication that we have to deal yes, with, yes. very, very dangerous on many levels. But we didn't, know, we didn't have it in our minds that that could happen. Mm. And what I would say is, what's going to happen next? The bad guys are not waiting for us to catch up. Mm. They're thinking about the next dimension of how to radicalize, how to recruit, what they can do, what how, and not just on the kinetic side, mm -hmm. but how do you lure those young people mm. in? Mm. We're nowhere ready uh, for that. Oh, boy, that's a little depressing to hear about. I, one last uh, question, though, as you are probably aware, uh, at the national security level in our country, there's a new buzzword in the last year or two about great power competition. Uh, and there's a lot of concern that, that perhaps we as a nation need to focus more on those state actors, on Russia and China. And, and many are concerned that that might actually take attention and funding away from some of these really important homeland security efforts. How, how do you think we can sort of get the attention uh, of leaders, but also the American people, uh, so that we can continue and maybe increase the focus on the problems you're talking about? Well, I think that wise leaders in our nation need to look at our country uh, in the context of the 21st century and what's happening. Hmm. And even the way we talk is still the Cold War. 
uh, it's still stuck in this in this system, uh, this this international system that we think is the only system that is out there. It is not that we cannot walk and chew gum at the same time. I think we're capable of doing both. And I also know from the from the from this fear that something is going to overtake, that there, there's more money that's going to be spent on the war mm -hmm. of ideas, that's a joke. Mm -hmm. um, when we look at how little money has been spent on soft power, uh, it, it, is, it, it, mm -hmm. it is inconceivable that we could ever get to a place that we're competing for the, the money from, mm -hmm. the, from the military. It just, we will, not, we will never get there. What we ought to be doing is looking with real, a, a realistic point of view on a couple of things. One, as I said earlier, idea, ideas have no borders. And the ideologies, the many different mm -hmm. kinds of things that are floating around online and offline are connected to a demographic. Millennials and Generation Z are what our country ought to be looking at. What does it mean for them to be living on planet Earth right now? How do they think about things? What's driving them? Companies know this information. They have been culturally listening to what's happening. They are connecting the dots around the world. We are not. We're living, we're living with blinders on as if you know there are stagnant things that are happening. That isn't going to allow us to be prepared for the next thing that could happen. These trends, these movements culturally matter to our bottom line. And, and I believe that both the executive branch of our government and the legislative uh, branch of our government has not understood fully mm -hmm. the implications of these giant shifts in, in, in the way people behave, what they think, and what it means around issues of belonging mm -hmm. and identity. And, uh, and it isn't just, am I from this country and this is what I believe, but the, the contours within that country, look at the changes that have happened in India, mm -hmm. even in the last few years, uh, how it feels mm -hmm. to be in mm -hmm. India and what has taken place and what that will mean. India, by the way, obviously the world's largest democracy uh, on planet Earth, uh, a colossal uh, source of diversity in terms of culture and and uh, and what that means for what's happening in that part of the world, but in my world, when I uh, the kinds of extremists that I have been working on in my career have been groups that are preying upon uh, Muslim kids. Uh, that's who uh, Al Qaeda and the so-called Islamic State mm -hmm. are going after. Mm -hmm. They're not right now trying to recruit Christians or mm -hmm. Jews or Hindus at this moment in mm -hmm. time. They're looking at people mm -hmm. who have a cultural affinity to Islam or mm -hmm. a religious affinity to mm -hmm. being Muslim, okay? Uh, when you look at numbers, in the year 2050, India will have the largest population of Muslims anywhere in the world, and they will be living as minorities. So when we think about, that's one data point, but there are many, many others in terms of shifts and trends. There's nobody in the US government who is preparing for what that might mean. Thinking about that, boy, well, I, this has been a fascinating conversation. Well, thank you. I, a, a little bit bracing, a little bit uh, uh, not necessarily uh, uh, giving me uh, a lot of comfort, except that I hope that uh, our discussion here and, and the ideas that you have in your book will help us all as a nation, as a community and society, uh, learn to, to grapple with these ideas as we go forward. Well, I, I've really enjoyed our conversation. What I do know is that even though these issues are really sober, it's a feeling of great despair if you think about it from the dimension of uh, our enemies. Yes. But the, on the positive side, solutions are available and affordable right now. Farah, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, your comments have been inspiring, but also uh, uh, got me thinking, and I hope that they'll get many more in our country, in our society, in our community thinking as well. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank you for being with us and watching and listening. <laughs>